So to continue what we said last time, uh, the power of the, an omnidirectional transmitter is radiated in all directions evenly. So uh, with the full uh, solid angle for pi, we have uh, it is distributed over an area that's equal to uh, 4 pi times r squared. And our pointing vector here is 1 r. Uh, so now radiated power divided by this area, for, by, by this area here. And area is 4 pi r squared. With no power loss, uh, power is just propagating in free space. There is nothing eating up this power. This power is traveling, and if there is no obstacle, uh, this power is traveling up away, away from our transmitting antenna to infinity. Uh, just to explain what we were doing here. So first, efficiency of the transmitter, then spreading the power out to the full square solid angle, and then collecting uh, the power with the receiver of a limited size uh, of, the, of, of a limited area here. Uh, now, uh, we saw the simple directional transmitter here. What, what is the question, please? What is the question here now? It's, the calculation was very easy if we had a simple spotlight here with a reflector. The spotlight does not generate a parallel beam. It, at large distances, this beam always beca becomes conical. And if we know the solid angle of this beam, well, the reception improves uh, as much as this solid angle is smaller than the, uh, the full solid angle for pi. That is, uh, uh, that is very simple to uh, talk about. Now the question is how to calculate how to, if we have a real antenna here. A real antenna will not have uh, such a nice beam, so a solid angle, uniformly illuminated solid uh, angle, uh, cone with in a solid, so a given solid angle, and nothing out of it. A real antenna will have a certain radiation pattern. So it, a real antenna will have a radiation pattern. So uh, a real antenna will have its uh, radiation, radiated, uh, radiated power. OK, one R the direction, some kind of a constant. When we had this physical constant, we'll have R squared. And here we have its amplitude radiation squatter, uh, pat pattern or uh, power squared or power radiation pattern we have up here. So this will be for any real antenna. Well, this uh, f of theta and not phi of phi is an arbitrary function. Well, we are going to try to make antennas that uh, have the, the, where this function makes sense. But still, it's an arbitrary function that may have a main radiating globe, may have side radi radiating globes, may have nulls, but not completely zero in all unwanted directions. So uh, this will be actually a much more complicated function than this simple cone here with the solid angle omega. Be much more complicated now. Now how to work in this, uh, uh, this case, how to uh, calculate the directivity in this case? In linear units, I'm not going to use anywhere logarithmic units. Logarithmic units are good for measurements, are good for laboratories, are good for specifications, but for uh, mathematical, uh, mathematical evolving formulas, mathematical formulas, it's better to use linear units. It's much, life is much easier with linear units. So the directivity will be actually the maximum pointing of vector. Pointing vector. Absolute value because of the vector yeah. divided by what would give uh, uh, an isotropic antenna. That makes sense. It makes sense how many times our antenna is better than the isotropic antenna. 
So what we can, can we say here? We can say that this S isotropic is simply the radiated power divided by the surface of the sphere or full solid angle multiplied by R squared. And uh, S max, we simply have to take what it is S max. S max. S max, uh, so we can uh, simply uh, take it out of here. 1R, this is okay. Uh, so we get rid of the absolute value. Alpha we have here. We have uh, R squared in the bottom. And we, here we have F of theta maximum radiation and phi maximum radiation. We have to take it in the maximum radiation squared. Okay? Uh, uh, I have to clear here immediately that some authors and some textbooks use a normalized radiation pattern here. If a normalized radiation pattern here uh, is used, this uh, constant alpha may disappear. Uh, I just prefer to use the constant. We know that we have currents, we have geometrical factors and so on in this alpha. Uh, but we just write it as a single constant here. Uh, now, what is uh, the P radiated, radiated power? We should, uh, the radiated power, we already did this, is the integral over the full solid angle of S uh, times uh, surface of the sphere, dA. Differential of the surface of the sphere over the full 4 pi. Okay, so this is integration over the whole sphere. We already did this with, uh, with the, uh, while calculating the radiation resistance of the wire segment, we did a similar uh, integral. I rewrite this thing here, so alpha times uh, now power radiation pattern of arbitrary theta and phi squared divided by r squared times what? Not times. Times, if, you, if I had vectors, I prefer not to say times. I just say multiplied because if I write it dot, everyone thinks about a dot product here. That's the reason why I don't want to write dots here. dA, what is dA? The differential of the surface. This is r squared times d omega, differential of the solid angle, where we have to dif uh, integrate over all solid angles over the whole 4 pi. Of course, from this equation, r squared cancels out. From this equation. Now, uh, we have to see what's the omega in the standard coordinates. We have standard spherical coordinates. The uh, omega. Now, theory is this one here, and this is perfect for theory, but for practice we have to actually calculate this inter integral. And the omega, if I'm talking in standard uh, uh, spherical coordinates, so we have polar angle and uh, longitude, this is sine theta, the uh, differential of theta, differential of phi. So my uh, rad whole radiated power is now alpha. That's a constant I could put it in front of the integral. Integral from 0 to p over theta. Integral from 0 to 2p over phi. Uh, here I have f of theta and of phi. Uh, absolute value squared. So to have the power pattern, uh, sine theta, d theta, differential theta, differential phi. So to know what I'm doing. Uh, on the top side, we have to insert this in the equation up here. Uh, in the equation up there, we see immediately the R squared, that R squared cancels out because 
r squared is uh, in the numerator, in the denominator is in the same position. This is going to cancel out. So it's independent on the distance where we're working. And uh, we see what we have in this fraction now. We have alpha times the maximum of the radiation pattern, theta maximum, uh, phi maximum squared, maximum of the power radiation pattern, so amplitude radiation pattern squared. And uh, down here we have 1 over 4 pi, because I r squared cancelled out. Then we have alpha, we can put it in front of the integral, integral over the whole solid angle. Uh, power radiation pattern in an arbitrary direction. We have to, this is the integration actually, integration over this arbitrary direction, uh, d omega. Again, our constant alpha cancels out. In this way, uh, we remove the requirement for this radiation pattern to be, uh, to be normalized. It will work with any direction pattern we have. And we see now what is the final expression. The final expression is maximum of the uh, 4 pi times max, uh, without the dot, because dot is dot product, uh, f of theta maximum phi maximum, absolute value squared, uh, divided by the integral over the whole solid angle 4 pi. Uh, radiation pattern of uh, theta and not phi squared uh, in ar an arbitrary direction over the whole solid angle integrated. Or if we rewrite this thing using, uh, uh, using this kind of integration over spherical coordinates, so the, we replace this uh, mathematical symbol, the, the omega, this solid angle, with conventional angles theta and phi of the spherical coordinates, uh, this thing simply becomes uh, 4 pi uh, f theta maximum phi maximum uh, squared, because we have the power pattern. And in the uh, denominator, we have from 0 to pi over theta from 0 to 2 pi over phi, uh, f of theta n of phi squared uh, sine theta d theta d omega. Or in other words, we could use yet another uh, definition. What is actually the radiation pattern? The radiation, uh, the, the directivity, not the radiation, but the directivity is actually our S Professor, is that d omega d phi at the end? Uh, yeah, d, 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 d. Sorry for the mistake. D phi here. Thank you for the correction. D phi here. So we could also talk, discuss the same thing in a different way. So we actually take. Uh, Take S maximum here. By divided by an uh, average S of our antenna. These are the simplest to calculate the average. Here we are actually calculating the average of this function. The average of this function over all possible angles. That could be also another definition of the directivity. Now, what does that mean? Can we make uh, an example, a calculation here now? Yes, we have a very simple antenna. We had it before. Our uh, current segment, uh, wire segment with current. Uh, the electric field was given as 1 theta uh, j k z 0 over 4 pi i times l. Uh, e to the minus jk r over r. And here we have at sinus theta. So what is now our radiation pattern? 
our radiation pattern is this here. Amplitude radiation pattern f of theta and dot phi is just this sine of theta. So this we know for our wire segment now. Can we calculate the directivity of this wire segment? Yes, we try. Uh, so we take the formula we have here. So directivity is 4 pi. What is theta maximum here? Uh, it's independent of phi, but theta maximum is actually pi half. Sin sinus of phi half is actually 1. So here we have 1 squared. Nothing very difficult to do. What we have in the denominator? In the denominator we have this integral. Uh, actually is an integral from 0 to pi, from 0 to to pi over the longitude. Our pattern is sine of theta. Absolute value squared times another sine of theta. d uh, theta d phi. Differential theta differential phi. We have to calculate now this integral. And at least once we have to do it. Last time we didn't do it because there was no time. So this thing here is independent of phi. So we can calculate over phi. We have 4p in the numerator, 2p in the denominator, and we are left with the integral from 0 to p. Uh, sine squared theta is always positive, so this uh, positive and real, this absolute sign has makes no sense. Uh, sine of theta d theta. Okay, we could uh, also say sine cubed, but it's not convenient at this moment. So 4p and 2p cancel out to have just the uh, 2 in the top. And we have to work on this uh, integral. So we have to introduce a new variable u is cosine of theta. Now du, differential of u, is uh, minus sine uh, theta d theta, theta, not phi, theta, theta, I hope it's, it, you can read it here, theta. So what we have here now, uh, we have integral, uh, sine theta is what, is 1 minus u squared, so 1 minus u squared, uh, du, is minus sinus theta d theta, we have sinus theta d theta here, so it's du. But uh, since the sine has changed, we have to invert the uh, limits of the integral. So the integral now goes from minus, minus 1 to plus 1. Before it went from plus 1 to minus 1, in uh, exchanging the limits of integration, we can also uh, handle this minus sign here. And we see what we get out, 2. 1 integrated from minus 1 to plus 1 is 2. Uh, minus u squared integrated is minus u cubed, u to the third power, uh, thirds. And uh, this thirds comes out. So u cubed from minus 1 to plus 1 is also 2. So this is minus 2 thirds here. Uh, and we have four thirds in the numerator, so uh, solving the fraction is number two. Four thirds, four times three to the four thirds we had in the numerator. And we have how much here? Uh, one point half. One and a half. So uh, the directivity of a short segment of wire is not omnidirectional. Uh, it's sinus theta, the radiation pattern. And our directivity now is uh, one and a half. And this is actually larger than one. So uh, even uh, such a stupid antenna, like a short segment of wire, already has a directivity larger than one. In fact, in radio, it is very difficult to make omnidirectional antennas. Uh, next thing. Uh, we have to look at the receiving side right now. At the receiving side, 
and at the receiving side, I will draw here many different receivers. Uh, it's better to, okay, I, I'll delete that afterwards, uh, just to have a look at the receiver right now. Uh, we didn't talk yet, yet about the receiving side of our radio link. So we saw here, this was an example how to calculate the directivity. Now, what can we do in the receiver? We may have different receivers. I will draw two identical receivers. Uh, each receiver will consist of four receiving antennas, four dipoles. Okay? But there will be a difference. In the upper case, I'm first going to connect all my antennas in parallel using cables of the correct lens to have this summation in phase. If it is not in phase, I'm not going to get the maximum output out of my receiver. So you should be very careful to have all the wires of the correct length. And uh, after this, I'm going to put my detector. My detector here now is, for instance, a rectifier. A rectifier. And now I'm going to pull out the DC components by inserting chokes here. And here I get the DC power, so minus and plus DC power out of my receiver. This is one possible of way of making the receiver. Uh, I have uh, covered my receiver area with four antennas. I connected the four antennas in parallel, taking care of the wires, say L1, L2, L3, and L4, are carefully selected to have the summation in phase here, the summation of all signals. I have just one rectifier, just one receiver, and uh, with uh, true RF chokes, I remove the RF component, I only have the DC current on the output. There is another possibility that looks very, very similar, but it's not the same. I put a rectifier in every single antenna. So here a rectifier, here a rectifier, here a rectifier, here, and another, yet another rectifier here. Okay, I keep care to connect all uh, the minus signs of the, the minus connections of all, all four rectifiers. I can connect them together. And here I need not keep care about the length of the wires because this is just DC. And I get the mi minus DC here. And the plus, plus DC, I get it from the, uh, the cathode side of the rectifier. So this is choke, RF chokes I'm drawing here. And I'm going to connect all these chokes together. I need not keep care about the length of the cables here because this is DC. Okay, now, shouldn't make a short here. I hope you, uh, you understand what I am doing. Here I have one common rectifier for all antennas. Here I, each antenna has its own rectifier. Of course, I can only transmit AC signals. I cannot transmit DC because with DC I have no radiation. Now the question is, which one is better? Or which one would you use in your radio? No answer. 
what would you do here? Which, which of these two solutions to use? Depends on what you need. Depends on what, what you're going to do with your receiver. Uh, in this case here, if I write uh, uh, unit normal here, we only have the Lambert law. So if the wave is coming under an angle, here, the radiation is coming under an angle, say, theta of the receiver. Here, the, uh, the radiation pattern of the receiver, receiver of theta receiver and phi regarding to our receiver, is just uh, the power radiation pattern is just the Lambert law in physics. So this is just the cosine of theta receiver. This is called also the Lambert law. The Lambert law in physics. So very simple relationship. This is just the, uh, the dot product really between these two here. That's all what we have. But up here, the upper, uh, the upper example is not that simple. We are getting signals here, 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 and here. In this case, the phase of the individual signals is important. Well, here is not important. Uh, that the phase is important means that if I'm changing the direction of the transmitter here, I may, each individual antenna still, still receives the signals, but those signals may cancel out here at the summation point because they are not in phase. If the single, uh, single contributions of every single antenna is not in phase with the other contribution, it's going to cancel out. So here phase is important and uh, 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 the radiation pattern is much more complex. A receiving radiation pattern, so F uh, receiving of theta and of phi may be a very complicated function because of this interference between the four, uh, the, the, small, the small individual, the four small individual solutions. So this receiver is going to be much more directional than this receiver. Uh, we co could call this a coherent receiver. And we could call this a non-coherent So we already have a distinction between how we made this receiver. This is very sensi sensitive to the uh, direction of arrival of the radiation. This is almost, almost not insensitive. Lambert law is a very slow law, so it has no relationship to the size of the antenna. And uh, what comes out of this complex receiving pattern? It comes out that this receiver may have a uh, we may also define a directivity on the receiving side. So this directivity is actually equal to 4 pi over lambda squared times area. Uh, now I pulled this equation out of my pocket. Uh, in, two uh, in two weeks, after two weeks, we are going actually to derive this equation, to prove this equation. But uh, the receiver may also have a directivity because of a very complex radiation pattern caused by the, uh, caused by, by the interference between the different, uh, different uh, uh, contributions by different antennas. Well, here phase is important. Every antenna has its own phase, and phase is important. Uh, there is something similar going on in the transmitter. Uh, before we proceed with 
our discussion. In the transmitter, we may also do many different things. We may have uh, the same area occupied by the transmitting array. But we can have an all the antennas, all the four individual antennas, individual elements, connected just to one generator. So I only have one generator here, and I'm connecting this generator with carefully selected cables. Cable lens L1. L2, L3, and L4 to the individual test. This is the usual way to do things in radio. But uh, I can also do something different. I can put a generator in each antenna. Each antenna has its own generator. I can also do this. So what can I say here in the upper? This is now a coherent transmitter. This is a non-coherent What are now the practical, uh, the practical implementations of this? A coherent transmitter, we know the phase, phase node. Phase is known, and we know the radiation pattern. The radiation pattern here is known. And this radiation pattern, also here we have uh, the definition that directivity of this transmitter is actually pro exactly proportional to its area, if this is the area of the transmitter. Here the phase is unknown. Because uh, the individual generators are not synchronized between. So uh, there is no sync between the individual transmitter. In phase is unknown, and so uh, here we almost do not cannot achieve a narrow beam. With a mirror, with a uh, converging mirror, we achieved our spotlight. So that, that we knew the phase of the radiation of any single point of the mirror. And the surface of the mirror was cleverly chosen as parabolic to correct the phases of all individual contributions to get the maximum radiation where we wanted. So what are now the practical cases we hear? Let's start with optics. So this case up here is certainly a laser. A laser oscillates on a certain mode, and that mode has its phase known in every point of the transmitting surface. Uh, down here, non-coherent, is thermal radiation. Where every point is uh, transmitting independent of all other points, so generators are not synchronized. This slide bulbs on the top of this room are uh, non-coherent transmitter. Every grain of the phosphorus that's emitting white light here is not synchronized to the other grains. So these light bulbs have a pretty omnidirectional pattern. On the other hand, the laser 
can transmit a very narrow beam. We can collimate the li light coming out of a laser to have a very narrow beam. Uh, not just lasers, also a radio transmitter. A radio transmitter is also usually built this way. Thermal radiation, uh, we also have in radio, we have noise. Thermal noise that's being radiated by many non-cooperating transmitters that are not synchronized among them. So we know, don't, don't have thermal radiation just in optics. We also have thermal radiation in radio and it's ma mainly a contribution from, contribution from noise. So we have both cases here and we have both cases here. A coherent receiver, this is usually a radio antenna. Most antennas are built this way as arrays, as phased arrays together. But we also have this uh, solution here. This may be in optics a photodiode. Every single point of the crystal of the photodiode is sensitive to light and operates independently of all other points on this photodiode. So photodiode uh, can only can only resemble the Lambert, Lambert law for its radiation pattern, not the complicated radiation pattern of a tele. Uh, this thing here may also be used in radio, but its application is quite particular. So this was proposed for power transmission, for communication. Communications. This is a radio for power transfer. Since uh, this antenna needs not be adjusted exactly to the transmitter because it has a very broad radiation pattern, it can receive more than one transmitter and it can convert the power efficiently into DC regardless of the exact transmission position of the transmitter. So this was proposed but this is seldom used. Usually photodiodes are much more uh, frequently used than, uh, than uh, such rectifier, rectifying antennas with rectifiers built in. This is uh, in radio, we usually have this too. In radio, we usually have a coherent transmitter and a coherent receiver. This is the usual solution for the radio link. So this is link. This is signal. But uh, in radio, noise is going this way. Noise is usually thermal noise. It's generated by non-synchronized non transmitters. It may also be interference because the people that are interfering us, our radio communication, they don't even think about us. They are just, uh, uh, that's the side product of their transmission is interference to our communication. So interference may also originate from several non-synchronized uh, non, uh, transmitters. So we are going to have to deal with this one or with this one. Uh, we are probably not, this is a very simple cell, cell, cell communication to, for power, power transfer using radio. In fact, uh, this was used, was proposed by NASA uh, some 50 years ago as a space power station. A coherent transmitter transmitting here one gigawatt of power at 2.4 gigahertz where there was no Wi-Fi yet there. And uh, on the transmitting side, of course, we should on the satellite, we should have a transmitter in geostationary orbit. We should have a satellite that beams this transmission just to one spot. So we need high directivity here, very narrow beam here. But on the receiving side, we want to, to receive everything what we can get not just from this satellite, also from other satellites, from other directions, just to have just one receiving station because this receiving station was proposed to be around 10 kilometers across, so not very small, quite expensive, but for one gigawatt of power, you, you will probably, going to, uh, probably do that because this power is free otherwise, except for building the space power station. So this, this was also proposed actually to be done and experiments on the ground were made at 
a few kilometers distance and a few 10 meters of antennas in diameter, uh, still using a rectifying array on the receiving side. Uh, for now, for our signal communication, we are going to deal with this link here. We are going to briefly mention noise when we come to thermal radiation and thermal noise with antennas. So we are going to consider this link here and this link here. Uh, we are not going to use the non-coherent reception uh, in radio. Of course, we use it in optics. optics. The photodiode is a uh, coherent reception. So let's try now to make some link calculations using these new definitions. So uh, what is new here actually? If we have coherent receiving and transmitting antenna, there is a close relationship, very close relationship between the antenna size and the antenna directivity. This is new. And we are going to prove this in two weeks when we get to the Huygens source. But we cannot do that today. Uh, we have to calculate now the radio link using these new units. Uh, also, we should consider that with radio communication, uh, we hope that we are able to do better, uh, to make better antennas than Nikola Tesla and Guglielmo Marconi. Uh, we hope to do it better. So the efficiency of our antenna is close to unity. We don't really lose much power. So how are we going to make our link right now? We're going to make our link in this way. This is our transmitting antenna uh, connected to a generator. And this is our receiving antenna connected to a load. The, uh, this resistor represents our load. This is the receiver, this is the transmitter. Now, what is our calculation? We have here transmitted power. We have here received power. The antennas are put at the range R. OK. Now we have on the transmitting side, we have an efficiency of the transmitter that's hopefully going being close to 1. The efficiency of the receiver, if we are making things good, is also close to 1, except for a very important exception. Your mobile phone, you know that people don't like antennas. And uh, mobile phones have usually very poor efficiencies for the antenna. But that's, uh, that's an issue of mobile, mobile phones, uh, not a technical issue. If I, was building mo if I were building mobile phones, then I would uh, put a good antenna on a mobile phone, no, not, not the shit they have right now. Uh, we have a directivity of the transmitter and we have uh, an area of the receiver. Okay? So now we have all figures. And we can calculate our link. So the first calculation is what we did the hour before. So power in the receiver is transmitting power times efficiency of the transmitter times directivity of the transmitter uh, divided by 1 over 4 pi r squared. This is the uh, sphere surface of the sphere that's the power is distributed if it were omnidirectional. Uh, then we have area of the receiver and efficiency of the receiver. Okay. We could also rewrite this using gains, but uh, let's leave it this way. This was the formula we got uh, before for an arbitrary case of coherent or non-coherent reception. But now we have both sides coherent. If we have here the coherent receiver, so if we know the phases of each individual contributions, then the uh, directivity of the receiver is uh, given by uh, 
for pi over lambda, uh, area of the receiver. Or, uh, in the other words, area of the receiver is lambda, squ lambda squared over 4 pi. Uh, I hope I, I wrote squared yesterday. I wrote squared. Lambda should be squared here, so just, just to check. Uh, directivity of the receiver. So, I can rewrite now this equation in a different form. Power in the receiver is power of the transmitter. Uh, efficiency of the transmitter, directivity of the transmitter, uh, 1 over 4 pi r squared. Uh, now I have area of the receiver, I replace it uh, by lambda squared um, 4 pi. Uh, directivity of the receiver, uh, efficiency of the receiver. I could also use gain. Gain of the receiver is uh, efficiency of the receiver times directivity of the receiver. Uh, so I could replace these items, we're rewriting in this way, power of the transmitter, uh, gain of the transmitter, gain of the receiver, because I have gain of the transmitter here, gain of the receiver here. Uh, and then I have this lambda over 4 pi r and Everything is squared here because for pi is squared, r is squared, lambda is squared. Okay? I can rewrite the equation in this way. And yet I have yet another possibility. Uh, say the transmitter, I can also replace this directivity of the transmitter is given by 4 pi over lambda squared uh, times area of the transmitter here. So I have here now power in the receiver is power of the transmitter, uh, efficiency of the transmitter, uh, 4 pi over lambda squared, uh, area of the transmitter, 1 over 4 pi uh, r squared, uh, uh, and here I have area of the receiver, uh, uh, efficiency of the receiver. 4 pi cancels out, and I can rewrite the equation. This is power of the transmitter, uh, a single fraction here. In the numerator, I have efficiency of the transmitter, area of the transmitter, efficiency of the receiver, area of the receiver. Uh, in the numerator, I have lambda squared and r squared. Same equation rewritten in three different ways for coherent reception. And also coherent transmission. as it usually then in radio communication. Now, the question out of all this discussion comes, what wavelength should I use for radio communication? That's a very, very general question. What wavelength is the best for radio communication? Most. The first equation states that the link budget is independent of the wavelength. The second equation states that the received power is proportional to the lambda squared. You see here lambda squared. And the third equation states that the received power is inversely proportional to lambda squared. They cancel out. No, they don't cancel out. We have just three equations telling exactly the same thing, but uh, the result is a little bit strange here. So this equation proposes to use the longest possible wavelength, and this equation here proposes to use the shortest possible length. And the initial equation says we are not dependent on the length anyway. 
We're independent. So now, what's the difference between these three equations? All equations are called after Fries. Fries was a radio engineer that designed many antennas. Uh, also, the rhombic antenna is his design, uh, living, uh, working between the two world wars in the time frame. And at that time, uh, these terms came out, directivity and gain. So he could talk about this thing before. These things were not known, and uh, these things were not known, and he could not write his equation because he had no numbers to put in. But now, what is the, what is the story about? This is what you can get from high school physics. No wavelength inside, simply propagation of radiation. And what we did the first hour today. Nothing very, very clever. This is what Guglielmo Marconi did. Guglielmo Marconi was unable to make particularly direct antennas, at least at the beginning of I talk 1900, not 1930, but 1900 year. Since he was not able to make high gain antennas, highly directional antennas, you need directivity to get the gain. The efficiency was low anyway. But uh, what Guglielmo Marconi did, he tried to use the longest possible wavelength. Uh, Guglielmo Marconi, in the beginning, in the 1900s, he even tried to hook his antenna wires on free-flying balloons to have the highest possible antenna the, for the longest possible wavelength. And in fact, initially, in radio waves, uh, radio waves were used only using very long wavelengths, say, from one kilometer up to 10 kilometers wavelength. Because that's the only thing that worked with his uh, very inefficient receiver he had. So if you don't know how to make gain with your antennas, this is the right equation to go. Where do you uh, also this limitation applies? This limitation applies if you are having two handheld radios. Two handheld radios have non-directional antennas because you don't know how people do turn these radios while talking on them. So as long as you have non-directional antennas, both receiver and transmitter, this is the equation that applies, you go to the longest possible wavelength that's practical to radio, for your radio. So a radio, handheld radio probably cannot have his antenna longer than one meter and one meter and a half. And this is the reason why frequencies around four meters wavelength were first used for military short range communication because that's what worked. If you have uh, the idea of broadcast, so one transmitter to many receivers, or one base station to many cellular phones, what is there the limitation? You have a very well ra defined <coughs> radiation pattern on the transmitting side. So this one is defined, and uh, this here is omnidirectional. So this, this equation here applies when you have a directional antenna on one side and an omnidirectional antenna on the other side. Of course, the directional antenna needs to, needs to be set up properly like a tower uh, for mobile phones or a television tower on a mountain, mountain top, and those antennas are very large and very expensive. What is the third possibility? The third possibility is a point-to-point -point link. You have a link that has both directional antennas on both sides. Where can you here get the maximum range? If you are in vacuum, you can go to optics. Optics, laser communication has far the largest range in totally free space. If you have the Earth's atmosphere in between, then you have to go down to microwaves and millimeter waves. For instance, the James Webb radio telescope is transmitting its data back to Earth on a, frequent, on a wavelength of about 10 millimeters, 30 gigahertz. Because at 30 gigahertz, with the antenna that you can fit on the James Webb, James Webb is very well stabilized because it's a telescope observing stars. So you need to know where you do you point it. So it's not a problem antenna pointing. On the Earth, it's also not a problem pointing the antenna, but an antenna larger than 60 meters you cannot build on Earth. And so you have 
define the areas of the antennas and you work on the pointing of this antenna to have the highest possible data rate. Or an inter interstellar probe is the same, same thing if you send a uh, probe to Jupiter or even further on to Neptune or somewhere, somewhere in deep space, then you have two directional antennas both sides and on both sides you are limited with the size and you try to go to as high a frequency as you can as long as you are with the radio waves. In fact, they are always pre already thinking for interstellar, uh, for inter, uh, for solar pr uh, probes inside our solar system. They are already thinking about laser, using laser communications and using a receiver in lower orbit but outside the atmosphere so you can use optical wavelengths. So this proposes optics, this proposes very long waves. This is probably old technology or where we, when we cannot point the our antennas. This is when we can work on the pointing and we are limited with the size of our antennas. So we should understand which formula to use depending on our uh, application. Also this one makes sense because in some occasions we have a defined directivity on one side and defined antenna size on the other side of the link. Uh, that's for this hour. Uh, yet next hour we have to look at some details about measuring antennas because things are not that simple as I have them here. Uh, so here is lowercase r. r, I wrote it this way. Sorry for the mistake. r in our equation. And what we should look in uh, next hour is uh, a subtle problem we don't see right from these equations. r is always in the denominator here in the denominator here, here in the denominator, here in the denominator, always r squared. What happens if I decrease the distance between the transmitter and the receiver? If I decrease r, I could get, according to this formula, according all three formulas give the same wrong result. I could get more power in the receiver than I put in my transmitter. And we have to look at this problem next hour.